In these slides, I'd like to give you a brief introductions on limits. So the real question is, as you're approaching an x value from the left or the right, what are the functional values approaching? So if you think about a function, the real question you're asking yourself when you talk about a limit is as you pick some particular x value on the x-axis and you approach that from the left and the right, exactly what's happening to the functional values as you do that? So formally we have a notation, and this notation is read the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l. And let's define these pieces. So c is called the limit point. f of x is the function. And l is the limit. So this is a mathematical notation that would say, for example, that if I had some function f of x, and I was approaching c from both the left and the right on the x-axis, then the functional values would be getting closer and closer to l. And we'll see what that looks like in a few minutes. So our first rule for finding the limits is to plug in the limit point. So the first rule of limits is to always take that limit point and plug it into the function. If you do that and you get a finite number, then this will be the value of the limit. So let's look at an example. Here we have the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x minus 1, and we see that that's equal to 3. Now how do we get that? Let's look at the picture on the right. As I approach 2 from the left and I approach 2 from the right, we see that the functional value is actually 3. And so if I took that 2 and plugged it into my function 2x minus 1, I would see that I would actually get 3 there. All right, here's another example. Here I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 1 of 3x squared plus 2. So I have the graph of that function on the left. You see it's a parabola that has been pushed up two units. Now as I approach 1 from the left and the right, you see that the functional values are getting closer and closer to 5. And if I actually substitute 1 in for the function, I get 3 times 1 plus 2, which is 5. So my first rule of plugging in the limit point holds in this case. All right, but certainly we can have more complicated functions that we might need to find the limit for. So let's consider another rule. So the second rule of limit evaluation is to do algebraic simplification. And one of the clues or cues that we're going to look for to tell us that we might want to do algebraic simplification is if when we plug in our limit point we get a zero in the denominator. Because as you recall, fractions are undefined if there's a zero in the denominator. So let's look at the next example. Here I want to take the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x squared times x minus 2 over x minus 2. Now if you do a quick check, our first rule says that we should plug in the limit point. If we do that, you see that you get a 2 minus 2 in the denominator, and then you'd have a 0 in the denominator, and that would certainly be undefined. So let's think about what else we might be able to do. Our problem is that we have that x minus 2 factor in the denominator. So let's consider an algebraic simplification. So I have taken away on the side there the 2x squared times x minus 2 over x minus 2. I'm going to deal with the algebra first before I consider the limit. Clearly I can cancel the x minus 2 in the numerator and denominator. This has a value for me because it actually takes away the issue of having a 0 in the denominator as that limit point goes to 2. So now, after the algebraic simplification, I just get that that whole expression looks like 2x squared. So I'm ready to take my limit now, and you'll see that I'll carefully write it all out. So for each of my problems, I've written here the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x squared times x minus 2 over x minus 2 is going to be the same thing as the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x squared. Now I'll simply plug in my limit point, and that will be 2 times 2 squared, which is 8. We can take a look at this picture. Here's our function. As I approach 2 from the left and the right, see that my functional values get closer and closer to 8. But also notice here, and this is very interesting, for this function, there is no actual functional value at 2. 
So as we mentioned in our second slide, what we're looking at when we talk about limits is the behavior of the function as I approach the limit point. In many cases, this is not what the actual functional value is at the limit point, because in this case, the limit point is not even in the domain of the function in question. So just remember that when we talk about limits, we're talking about behaviors and not necessarily functional values. Here's another example of the same type. What happens to the function f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 is x equals 1, or we should say x approaches 1? Well, I've made a chart here on the side, and so I've used some x values, and what I've done is pick some x values approaching 1 from the left-hand side of 1, namely 0 0.97, 0 0.98, and 0.99, and then I've also selected some x values on the right-hand side of 1, for example, 1.02, 1.01, and 1.001. You see there their functional values. So for example, look at 0.97, and we see that the functional value is 1.97. As we work our way down, look at 0.99, and we see the functional value is 1.99. If we look on the right-hand side, looking at the functional value uh, for x equals 1.02, we see that functional value is 2.02. If we work our way back towards 1 from the right-hand side of 1, we see that when x is 1.001, we have a functional value of 2.001. Clearly, if we think about this, it looks like as we get closer to 1 from both the left-hand side of 1 and the right-hand side of 1, the functional values are getting closer and closer to 2. And so I've graphed the function on the left-hand side of the slide here. Notice that the function looks just like a straight line, but it has a hole in it at 1. And the reason why it has a hole at 1 is because for the function f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x minus 1, 1 is not in the domain of the function. And that is because when x equals 1, we have a 0 in the denominator. But from our chart, it certainly looks as though as we approach 1 from the left and as we approach 1 from the right on the x-axis, the functional values are getting closer and closer to 2, and therefore our limit as x approaches 1 for this function should be 2. So let's consider doing this algebraically on this slide here. So the first thing I know is, notice, as we mentioned before, is that at x minus 1, in the denominator, we know that when x is 1, we'll have a 0 in the denominator, so this definitely indicates we might want to try some sort of algebraic simplification. So we'll factor the numerator, and so we get the numerator factor to x plus 1 times x minus 1, and clearly the x minus 1's cancel. And so this function really looks like the function of x plus 1, with the exception of that whole at x equals 1. So if we take the limit of x plus 1, then we can write our solution carefully by saying that the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 should be the same thing as a limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1. At this point, we can plug in the limit point, and that should be equal to 1 plus 1, or 2. This is the second time I've written a solution completely for you, and I want you to notice a few things in writing solutions to limit problems. First, we continue to write the limit as x approaches a limit point, all the way until the point that we actually substitute the limit point in. So notice I have the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 is equal to the limit as x approaches 1 of x plus 1, which is equal to, and at this step I'm actually plugging in the limit point, so I no longer have that limit notation, so I just have 1 plus 1, and of course that equals 2. So now let's dig a little deeper into the theory of limits and kind of think about how we can codify all the things we've mentioned in these previous slides. So first we say, now let's look at what happens as we approach from the left and the right, or namely what we talk about left-hand limits and right-hand limits. So we can define a left-hand limit, and we say that occurs when we approach the limit point from the left. And so we have a different notation, and this is read the limit as x approaches c from the left, that's what the minus sign as a subscript means, of f of x is equal to k. So it's almost the same as a limit notation we had before, except there's a subscript, I'm sorry, a superscript, excuse me, 
of a minus sign. And this superscript of a minus sign indicates that we're approaching the limit point from the left. Be careful because this does not mean minus C. Minus C would be on the left-hand side of the C. So when we have a superscript of a minus sign, that means approaching the limit point from the left. Similarly, a right-hand limit occurs when we approach the limit point from the right. And this is written as a limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x is equal to l. Again, notice that there is a superscript of plus sign on the limit point, And this indicates that we're approaching c from the right. Now, it turns out that in order for a limit to exist, the limit from the left and the limit from the right must exist and they must be equal. When we say that that limit must exist, what we mean is that it is a finite number. In some subsequent sections, we'll see that there are limits that go to plus or minus infinity. And so we're talking about here limits that exist. So the limit from the left and the right, they must exist. Namely, they must be equal to a finite number. And that finite number must be the same thing. So we can write this nicely using our limit notation as the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x must be equal to the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x. And if both of those are equal to l, then we can simply state that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l. So to recap, the first thing we want to remember about limits is that we'll plug in the limit point first when we're trying to evaluate them. Second, if plugging in the limit first doesn't work, we'll attempt an algebraic simplification, and then we'll plug in. And finally, the theoretical aspects of limits indicate that the limit from the left has to be equal to the limit from the right for there to be a limit at C.